So I've been asked to give a very impromptu talk. Unfortunately, the speaker for the slot was not able to make it. Um, I had some prepared talks ready for you guys, but these are talks I've given quite a number of times in the past, and after a while you get tired of them. So if you really want to see a generator's talk, we can pull that out, or if you'd really like to see an embedding talk, we can pull that out. But I can give you a couple of small pieces that usually make their way into lightning talks, but if we're lucky, we can extend to fill the time allotted. That's me speaking very slowly to fill all my time. So one thing that I like to do in my spare time is hack around with CPython. And I know that we're told that PyPy is the wave of the future, that PyPy is where Python's going. One thing that I find a little bit disappointing about PyPy is that as an interpreter, it's a, it's a lot harder to understand what's going on internally. This is a problem that I found with C++. I started off as a C++ programmer. This is what I studied in school, and one of my first jobs, I was hired as a C++ programmer, and it was during that job that I transitioned into Python. In that experience, I found that you would often be given a piece of code where there was some interaction between two or three features. Maybe you're using operator overloading, you're using some advanced features, placement new, or R value references, or I can't even remember all the features that are available in C++11, and now C++17. Uh, but there's some strange interaction between the features. And as a consequence of those interactions, the code just kind of falls over. It does something very unexpected. This happened a lot with interactions between, say, templating and virtual tables and operator overloading. And I'm sure we've all been in a situation like that where you get this error from your compiler and it's absolutely and totally inscrutable. And you're, you're supposed to be able to understand how these features interact and you're supposed to have some tools in order to determine what went wrong, in order to be able to make a convincing argument that this is what went wrong, and if we make these small changes or these fixes here, we can take broken code and make it working code. And I found that the way that that was done in C++ was somewhat unsatisfying to me. In one sense, we were, I think, a little bit too reliant on documentation. C++ is a language with a formal spec, and so we're supposed to be able to rely on the specification in order to tell us what's right and what's wrong, even though the specification in many cases has you know, large gaps in it. If you go into Stack Overflow and you look at some of the harder C++ questions there, you'll see there's one gentleman from, I believe Germany, a young kid from Germany, who has memorized you know, line and section every part of the C++ spec and can recite it for you if you have some question about interaction between these two features and can just, you know, like you'd see in a courtroom drama, go down to the nitty-gritty details of what each specific term means in some, some context. One thing that's nice about Python is that it has a reference implementation. And we're told that the disadvantage of a reference implementation is that it always overspecifies. That there's some behavior that the reference implementation has where this isn't documented behavior, it may not be intentional behavior, but one nice thing about that is you can at least come up with meaningful, from at least an engineering perspective, meaningful conclusions about the way the code works. And this is something that's very nice about Python and something that I always had a little bit of difficulty with with PyPy. For example, if we go into the, you know, the first time I downloaded the source code for PyPy, I had something that looked like this, and I tried to figure out where is the actual PyPy compiler, what are the steps, where can I put a breakpoint to just figure things out? And I was at a loss. In fact, I had to do something like tree to figure out where all these, where the actual code was located, and identifying how these files correlated to the actual steps in the compilation process was non-trivial. This is just the consequence of PyPy being a very sophisticated tool, and so naturally there's going to be a learning curve. One thing that's very nice about CPython is that we can see it's a very practical interpreter for everyday use. I'm sure many of us in the room are actually using CPython in production, and it also turns out to be an interpreter that is exceptionally easy for you to get into, for you to understand how it works, for you to understand the mechanics of, for you to just start with no knowledge whatsoever of CPython and just set a breakpoint and figure out what's going on internally. So I will give you the actual process that I took when getting into CPython. The first thing I did was I went to python.org and I downloaded one of the tarballs of the source code and I unzipped it and you can see these are all the CPythons I have here. And we'll choose the latest one that I have installed so we'll do everything based on 3.5. And let's see, do I have this built? Yes, I have this built. Very good. 
So what I did was I built it from source, and the CPython build system is pretty straightforward. It uses autoconf and autotools and make. Pretty straightforward. And actually, one of the reasons where, one of the things that drew me to Python was I was dealing with a very large C++ trade system. Uh, it was a system that was, in practice, absolutely an asset for the firm. It could be used from the front office all the way to mid office, the back office. You know, we had complete transparency over the numbers that were being generated for PL. The pricing that the front office did for its financial instruments was exactly the same pricing that the settlements team could use in order to determine proceeds, to determine how much money entered and left the firm. And we could actually tie out PL and position numbers from what the front office saw, what was sent up to senior management, with exactly what was in the bank account. So it was a beautiful system. But one unfortunate thing was, it was a large amount of C++ that had grown over about 15 years with large teams of distributed developers. So the build system had this one hiccup that we've all seen, which is you build it, you type your make-j9, and then it doesn't work. And you're told, oh, it just doesn't work the first pass, so just try it again. And suddenly on the second pass it works. And you can think, isn't that absurd? So one of the things that really drew me to Python the first time was I typed make, and uh, the build for Python is just a bunch of GCC calls, building objects. It was just the simplest, most straightforward build process that I'd seen for an application of considerable size. There's a lot of C code in C Python. I mean, we can see there's quite a bit of C here. And I did something just like this. I did, I did, I did a count of the number of lines, and I saw that the number of lines in C Python, in comparison to the number of lines that my business unit had written, were comparable, except the quality was much better. Just some of the operational characteristics of building it and maintaining the code was much better. So anyway, I had downloaded this code, I built it, and I started a Python interpreter. So we have a Python interpreter here. And I had known about this module in Python called dis. And after I got over the juvenile giddiness of writing code like this, No, nobody? It's an impromptu joke. Come on. Come on. At least, at least I can do this. And you'll laugh? No? Nobody remembers the 90s? <laughs> OK, anyway. So there's this module in Python called this. And what this gives you is this assembly of a Python function gives you the bytecode. And this is the first thing that I was looking into. And the bytecode is very easy to read if you have some function called double, and it takes some value, and it returns the value doubled. You can disassemble it, and you can see the bytecode. And if we look through the bytecode, I don't know if there's very good documentation of what all of the columns here mean, but the first column here is the line number. The second column is the offset into the bytecode. So the bytecode, if you look at it, um, uh, co-code, I believe. It's just this binary combination of opcodes. And so this is the actual offset into that. Then the third one is the interpretation of the opcode. Then the fourth column is the argument that it's passed. And this is an interpretation of the argument. So you can see in my function that doubles two things, I load x, I load a constant 2. This x is loaded fast, which means it's loaded from uh, some local storage. And then I call this opcode binary multiply, and I return a value. And what I did to get into CPython was literally I saw this binary multiply thing, and I did this. I grepped for it in the source code. I didn't read any documentation. I was like many programmers, too impatient to read documentation. I wanted to just dive in. So I literally went into the source code, and I grabbed for it. And I did one thing slightly more smartly than normal. I knew it was in a C file, so I just grabbed through all C files. Because you know if you grab through it, you're going to get matches into binaries and matches into documentation, and that's not what you're looking for. So I grabbed for binary multiply in all the C files. And I ended up with five hits. And if we look at the five hits, we can probably guess what they are. Compile.c is probably the Python compiler. It's probably what takes text and turns it into bytecodes. Peephole.c, well, that could be a lot of things. You could let your imagination run wild, but it's probably a peephole optimizer. We know that for bytecode, you can look at small sections of the bytecode and do small optimizations on it. And the last one, ceval.c. And the word eval in there is very suggestive. So if we look into ceval.c, and this actually used to be a lot clearer in Python 2 before they added some of the macros. But in Python 2, or in Python 3, if we go for a binary multiply, we'll see in the C eval.c on line 1495, 
there is this target thing. And in Python 2, there, there wasn't this target macro. They implemented this kind of, uh, I think the term of art is direct threading interpreter, something that if you Google for, you'll see a nice discussion of it by the guy who wrote LuaJet, Mike Paul, on how this gives you more cache-friendly uh, interpreters. But what these targets are, are actually just switch or just case statements in a big switch statement. So what you have here is just a giant for loop that's going over every opcode, then a switch statement that switches for every opcode, and then a case statement to handle that opcode. And that's just about the most basic structure you could think of for an interpreter. This is pretty much all there is to the CPython interpreter. And I found this to be extremely refreshing and very empowering because with just a little bit of work and a little bit of knowledge, I was able to get a foothold into what's a fairly complex system, CPython. So the next thing that I did was, let's go to our binary multiply. I just put a breakpoint here. So I loaded up my, my, Python interp my Python interpreter to GDB, and I put a breakpoint on line, let's say, 1496. So let's do that. GDB. That's what I want. So let's run our Python interpreter. We can see a Python interpreter here. We'll write our function. We'll control C to break into this, and we'll put a breakpoint in cval.c1496 was the line. There we go. And we'll continue our Python interpreter. Then we'll call our double function on a value, and you can see we've broken right into this. And if we do list, we can see all the code that we recognize, and here we can start stepping through the code base. And as we step through the code base, or if we look at the backtrace, we can see some very, very simple things. Now, if we want to get a little bit ahead of ourselves, a little bit more sophisticated, we'll have noticed that there's a tools directory in CPython source code, and there's a GDB directory in there, and there's a file called libpython.py that makes your life in GDB much easier. Now, remember, at the time, I had almost no experience using GDB. Almost all of my experience doing anything lower level than C I came from actually came from interacting with CPython. I learned everything I know about GDB, interacting with CPython, I learned everything I know about assembly, interacting with CPython. Which probably isn't the best marketing pitch for Learn Python. Learn Python, you'll get a lot of experience with assembly. But this happens to be my area of interest. Well, you can see we can do BT and that gives us a backtrace. And what that tells us is the stack frames that go all the way to the beginning. So this gives us a lot of really useful and very interesting information. For example, one thing that I always like to do when I'm trying to analyze some code is find the entry point. And you can actually see the entry point for Python is a main function in python.c. That calls pymain, that calls this, that calls that, that calls this, and you can see interactive loop flags. And if we go to the top of this, we can see that something ended up calling this function called pyeval frame x, sorry, pyeval code x, sorry, pyeval frame x, which is where your, where your interpreter was. And you can see this was a result of a fast function call. So that was my double call, then ended up trying to interpret the bytecodes that implement the double function in PyEval FrameX. That said, if I can split the screen here and look at my Python interpreter side by side, or look at the code base side by side with, that I have tags set up. We can actually step through this very easily. And CPython interpreter is written to be changed very easily. It's written for you to be able to modify it very easily for it to be a playground for language implementers and maintainers. And so it doesn't belabor optimizations. I built it, you know, outside of the optimizations that are available in Peephole and outside of some very reasonable optimizations like um, instance method caching, the interpreter is pretty straightforward. So we can actually step through this and see all the steps that are involved and doing something as simple as multiplying a value times two. Now bear in mind, multiplying a value times two is not as simple as it sounds. Because in my code, I said x times two. And that x times two could be anything times two. It could be a integer times two. It could be a float times two. It could be a string times two. It could be a custom object times two. It could be a numpy nd array times two. And each one of those will have very, very different code paths and very different consequences. So let's see how this gets dispatched. So if we do a, and I'm going to do this with a little bit of knowledge already, because I know which ones to step into and which ones to step over. 
So don't worry too much about that. But at the worst case, when I did this for the very first time, it was just very tedious. I'd step into every function, and it took me a couple of days to really get a hold of it. But there was no difficulty involved. It was just the time and the, finding the time to do it and having enough interest and passion to do it. So I can step into pi number multiply. And so what we can see is something very interesting from the overall structure of Python. Every one of these high-level opcodes has a corresponding pi object or pi number call. So for binary multiply, it's pi number multiply. And you can see that there is, at the C level, an API that reflects directly the syntax of the language. So if we're in pi number multiply, which is this code here, you can see immediately how we handle the situation between repeating and between actual multiplication. So you can see that there's some code here for determining if we have a sequence and whether we're doing some repeating of a sequence, such as multiplying a string or multiplying a list times two, versus some other operation. You can see that the sequence is handled differently. So first it's going to try and perform this binary op one, which will try and dispatch to, say, the long multiply or the uh, float multiply or some custom multiply that, you've, that you have um, implemented on your object. And so we can step into this and we end up in this code over here. And then as you go through, you can start answering some very simple questions for yourself. So one question is always, if we have a mole and an R mole implemented on two objects and there are subtypes of each other or there's some relationship between the two types, which one gets called? Obviously, if we do two primitive types multiplied times each other, that operation is, is clear. But what if we have two custom types multiplied times each other and they both implement this multiplication protocol? Which one gets called? And you can see the dispatch for that pretty clearly in the code. And you can see from the code, there's not a lot of knowledge of C necessary in order to understand this. You basically have to understand that the arrow means look up a field. There's almost no dot notation because everything's passed around as a pi object pointer. And then you have to be able to you know, appreciate that there may be macros, and so you have to look up those macros. And a couple of C-isms, like for example, when you, in your Python, if you do hash of two, it gives you two. And if you do hash of negative two, it gives you negative two. If you do hash of one, it gives you one. If you do hash of negative one, it gives you negative two. And that should be immediately obvious with just a little bit of understanding of some C-isms, which is clearly or most likely behind the scenes, this negative one is being used as some error value. And so some of those C-isms may be necessary in order to understand the CPython code base, but there's a fairly low bar to entry here. And you can see when you read through this code, it's pretty straightforward. They're checking to see if some, one of them is a subtype of the other one and if the method on that is implemented. And we can keep stepping until we actually find dispatch the method. And this is one way that I started to answer some very practical questions that people came up to me with about what happens in CPython. Things like, um, if I have two objects with these subtype relationships, which one gets called? Or when I overload this particular data me model method, what happens? Or when I try and do something like an import hook, how does that work? And these questions can be answered for you very easily from CPython just by reading through the code. And I always found those to be extremely satisfying answers, much more satisfying answers than the kind of answers I'd come up with with C++. Because in some case, with C++, they'd say, well, why did this code do this? And I'd have to either read through the spec or try to infer from the behavior. Or at the most, what I'd have to do is I'd look at C++ and I'd look at some emitted assembly and I'd say, well, I can kind of infer that between the C++ and this assembly, some steps happened. But it's very rare, I think, in practice for somebody to actually do GCC-S and emit all the steps of all the optimization and everything that happens in the compilation process and actually step through that and say, well, at this particular line in your compiler, this, this, and this happens. And that's not the nature of how C++ exists as a language. That's not how people are supposed to talk about C++. But I kind of liked in Python, you could talk about it in that way. I could say, well, the behavior of, for example, a common thing that comes up is when you put methods into a weak dictionary. Or if you put methods into a, into a, into, if you take weak references of instance methods, what happens? And there's a potential bug around there because you might lose access to um, methods because there's this method cache. And you can look into CPython and you can see where the method cache happens. And you can say usually confidently that 
at least in my execution environment, we're going to be standardized on CPython. So what happens in CPython is the truth for this circumstance. And you can give a very clear, you can very quickly and very effectively give a very straightforward answer to these kind of questions. One that's grounded in some fundamental truth, where that fundamental truth is, this is actually what's happening. And I found that to be much more satisfying than saying, well, the spec says this, and we're just hoping that the compiler or implementer has implemented it correctly, and if they didn't, this, this, and this happens. But beyond that, there was no gradual stepping between what you were able to do and what you wanted to explain. In the C++ world, it seemed like there was a very sharp cliff where you had to be almost a compiler expert to be able to answer some things. Whereas in Python, you could always step down a little bit in your comfort level. You could start with bytecode and then go down to C Python internals, and then if you chose, go down a little bit deeper. The other thing that you could do with this is you can start implementing some fairly neat things. And once you spend, I would say, maybe a couple of weeks just playing around inside C Python, just by setting breakpoints and understanding how things work, you can start to implement some fairly sophisticated features that actually don't take a lot of code to implement. So I'll show you two examples of that. Um, these are two things that I've given, you know, short lightning talks about. These were just things I did for fun. One of them was this topic of uh, custom literals. It comes up all the time. You know, we have a literal expression for strings. We have a literal expression for numbers, one for sets and dictionaries. And sometimes people say, well, couldn't we add our own literal expression for custom types? And you could think, well, what does that mean? And there's even a question of what, what's the difference between this, there's a semantic difference between this and this. And what is the semantic difference between the two of these? Well, the semantic difference is more or less that there, there's an operational difference in that this actually calls a function called dict with arguments. And this one is actually implemented in a, byte, in a piece of bytecode. But there's a semantic difference here in that at some point in code, somebody could do something awful like that. And if they did something like that, then your code may have very dramatic behavior. Whereas using the literal syntax would not actually be affected by this. The literal syntax is saying, construct a literal, and I don't care about what the binding of these built-in functions is. In practice, nobody does things like that, so the distinction is usually lost. But it does exist. So if you think about it in that sense, then you might say, well, literal syntax is just the ability for us to call functions at compile time. And we can do that in Python, except the compiler in Python is very, very small. The Python compiler doesn't really do a whole lot. It just takes source text, it builds a symbol table, it tries to infer the location of variables, and then it emits bytecode. And it doesn't really do a lot of work there. But one thing that you can do is you can play around with how evaluation works. And if you think about the evaluation of some Python code, there's a, module, there's a piece of module level code, and then inside that you have classes and functions, and there's these different runtime scopes. So what you could think of as an equivalent to ex increasing what you can do at compile time is you can start moving code into the earlier parts of runtime. And so I wrote a little bit of code to do that. It didn't take a lot of time. It took a couple days to do this, which looks something like this. So if you have a function and it returns a string times 10, this is a constant expression. And in some cases, the CPython interpreter is smart enough to be able to take constant expressions and calculate them. So if these were two integers, it would actually just emit in the bytecode the actual multiplication of the two integers. But in the case of slightly more complex ones, it's not smart enough to do that. So every time I'm calling this function, I'm multiplying this string times this number, even though the result will always be the same. And within the semantics of CPython, there's absolutely no way for this result to be anything but ASDF times 10. There's no way for me from the Python layer to overload any of those operations. So the result is really always strictly ASDF times 10. There's, it, it's a, it is a strictly constant expression. There's no, oh, what if I overload this, overload that? Not in this case. So you can see there's something missing there. Well, I was able to add this piece of syntax to eagerly evaluate any expression. So what this does is it eagerly evaluates expression one runtime frame up. So you can see here, when I disassemble, it's evaluated the expression one level higher than the definition and stored it as a constant. And you could think you could do some neat things with this. It's a fairly obscure thing that adds 
some very strange syntax to the language, but there are some kind of neat things you could do. For example, if you had some wrapper around SQL types and you wanted to do something like something like that, so some wrapper around that, and your code just to make sure that every time you typed an SQL statement, something was correct. Maybe the table existed or the SQL statement was well formatted, it wasn't just a, st a string, then you might do something like this. And in this case, you can see I'm doing a very simple thing. I'm just making sure that the only valid SQL statements are insert statements, otherwise it's going to fail. Well, with this, I could do something that looks like this. So this is often what our code looks like. The actual part of the code that we might want to determine at runtime is, nest, is nested a couple of functions deep or a couple of classes deep, a couple of scopes deep. And I have an error, but I'll only ever see this error some, at runtime. I'll only ever see this error where I call the wrapper function that's constructed within the bar function that requires an instance of the foo class. And so you can see I have an error lurking in the code. But if you can lift that evaluation up, then, then it makes things a little bit easier. And so I added one more, which lifts it up to module scope and lifts it all the way up. And you can see the assertion error is called. So what you can do is you can lift the evaluation of statements up. So you can do things like checking constants, kind of neat. And I'll show you one more that people seem to like a lot better than that one. I, I like this one even though the semantics are a little bit weird the AST expression. So hopefully I have a build of this that works. This one is really a testament to how easy it is to modify CPython. I was giving a talk in November, and I wanted to show some internal to Python stuff just as a quick example. And I had a conversation with a gentleman named Matthew Rockland, and he'd been complaining about how in libraries like NumExpr, you have to pass expressions as strings. He hated that. And, he, and I said, you know, if you wanted to, you could probably spend less than 500 lines of code and less than four hours getting this done. So it's 3 a.m., I'm in a hotel, or this is in London, so I'm in the closest approximation to a hotel that fit my budget. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm putting my slides together, and I say, okay, let me give it a try. Three hours later, I have this working. So it's kind of neat. I have the, you can add the ability to encode as literals syntax, little syntax expressions. So you have something like this. This represents the addition of x and y. And let's do one that's a little bit more complicated, x plus x plus y. You can bind this to a variable. And then you can fill in x, or you can fill in y, or you can fill in x and y. And then you can evaluate it. And you can start to do some really neat things outside of simplifying the syntax for something like SymPy or something like NumExpr. You can do some really neat things with this, like this. Small sub. Here we can bind the operation of a function being called on two arguments with the arguments swapped to a syntax tree. And then we can fill in strict values for x and y. And one thing I can show you is that you can always fill this in with another tree. So you can build trees really nicely, really easily. There we go. And then we can fill in all those values. And the only thing that we have that's unbound is actually the function. So we can fill in the function with an add and call it, with a mole and call it, or with a sub and call it. Kind of neat. And it's a kind of neat way of building expressions. And this took me 400 lines of code and about three hours to put into the Python interpreter. Now, I'm not saying the code's very good, but it is a testament to how easy it is to play with and modify the C Python interpreter. So that's my impromptu talk, trying to encourage all of you to look into this layer that sometimes we ignore and to encourage you to see this as something that's actually very easy and very open for you to explore and understand. You don't have to have any knowledge coming into it. In fact, all of the C that you need to know in order to understand what happens in C Python, you could probably learn from a 10 minute tutorial on C. It's very straightforward code and it's there written in such a fashion as to be understood and manipulated by average people. So I hope you enjoyed that impromptu talk. I'm James Powell, thank you so much.